This is the story of the sword in the stone. Long ago, in ancient times, when Britain was still a wild and restless place, there lived a noble king named Uther. For many years of turmoil, Uther defeated the invading armies and drove them from the land. From this triumph, his fellow British lords proclaimed him their High King, Pendragon, meaning the dragon's head. Soon after his coronation. Uther Pendragon met and fell in love with beautiful Lady Egrain, a widow whose husband Uther had killed in battle. Uther married Egrain and adopted her two young daughters, Margais and Morgan le Fay. The price for this love was a high one, however. In his passion, the king had asked for help from his sorcerer Merlin in winning the hand of Lady Egrain. In return, Uther had agreed to give up their firstborn son. Merlin had foreseen great evil descending upon the king, and felt that he alone could protect a young heir in the dangerous times ahead. Before long, a beautiful boy child was born, but the joy surrounding the birth was brief, for Merlin soon appeared to take the child away. But the child was just born! Exclaimed Uther. How did you find out so quickly? Silently, the old sorcerer led the king to a balcony and pointed upward. There, overhead, was a great dragon formed by the stars. Its vast wings arched over the countryside. You see by this sign, my lord, that it is not I who calls for your son, but destiny. Sadly, the king gave up his son, for Merlin convinced him that the child's great future was threatened. Indeed, Uther Pendragon died within a year from a traitor's poison, and Britain was once again plunged into darkness. After the death of the High King, the struggle for leadership tore Britain to pieces. The great alliance King Uther had forged was shattered into dozens of quarrelling, petty kingdoms, leaving no united force to oppose foreign invasion. Foreign armies swept in once again, and order gave way to chaos. Marauding knights roamed the countryside, taking what they wanted and burning the rest. No one was safe at home. Travel was even more dangerous, with outlaws ruling the roads. Fear was a constant companion of those who managed to stay alive. After sixteen turbulent years, the Archbishop of Canterbury summoned Merlin to help restore order. Although the two men were of different faiths, they had great respect for one another and shared much wisdom between them. Ah, I am at a loss, Sir Wizard. Confided the Archbishop, "I don't know how to help the people, and they are suffering more each day. If only Uther Pendragon were here." I share your concerns, my lord, but I have good news," said Merlin. Although the end of King Uther's reign left us in the dark for many years, it is at last time for the sun to return to Britain. A brilliant sun, my lord. Perhaps the brightest that Britain will ever know. But the sun was out this morning, sire," said the archbishop. "What has the weather got to do with this? I speak of the son of Uther Pendragon, the true heir of royal blood, who lives in a distant land and must now be summoned forth to keep his date with destiny. His date with who?" asked the archbishop. But the king had no heirs. Alas, that is our problem. I wish to prove otherwise, my lord," replied Merlin. "If I have your leave to use my magic, 
I shall create an event to bring forth this young heir and prove to the world that he is the true and rightful High King of Britain. The delighted Archbishop agreed immediately, and Merlin withdrew to devise his scheme. On a Sunday morning in late November, the great cathedral of London was filled to capacity. As mass was being said, a sudden murmur rippled through the crowd on the cathedral steps. Turning to see the cause of the commotion, the archbishop stopped in mid-prayer and walked toward the door. In the churchyard, he discovered a block of white marble with an anvil sitting on top. Driven into the anvil, gleaming in the pale winter sun, was a sword. Its blade was of flawless blue steel, and the hilt was of highly wrought gold. Engraved in the marble block were these words, Whoso pulleth out this sword from this stone and anvil is rightwise king born of England. Ah! So this is Merlin's plan, thought the archbishop, smiling to himself. A group of barons and knights suddenly pushed their way through the crowd, each stating loudly that he should be the first to try. A few managed to leap onto the stone and give the sword an unsuccessful yank before the archbishop stopped them. Order! Order! he shouted, raising his hands to quiet the crowd. I hereby proclaim that on Christmas morning... One month from today, all those who consider themselves worthy of attempting to pull this sword from the stone and anvil will be given the opportunity. He who wins the sword thereby wins the kingdom. A mighty roar of approval rose from the crowd. Some even danced and stomped their feet. Noticing how pleased they were, the archbishop went further. And to celebrate this momentous occasion, a tournament shall be held on Christmas Eve. With this, the delighted parishioners swept the flustered archbishop onto their shoulders and carried him jubilantly around the stone. They hadn't had such a cause for celebration in a long, long time. To all parts of the kingdom, messengers rushed out, carrying the archbishop's proclamation. Every castle and village was alerted, from Sussex to Cornwall, and finally to the dark forest of Wales. There lived a certain gentle knight by the name of Sir Hector Bonmaison, with his two sons. The elder was a handsome, robust youth, recently knighted, and now known as Sir Kay. The younger was a gentle blond lad of about sixteen, whom Sir Ector and his wife had adopted as an infant. His name was Arthur. Although Arthur was not of his blood, Sir Ector loved both sons equally and devoted himself to their upbringing. Sir Kay was the first to hear the news of the great events in London, for as usual, he was in the courtyard polishing his helmet when the messenger arrived. A tournament! At last, a tournament! he shouted. We must set out for London at once. Father, you know what this means to me. Yes, son, I do, said Sir Ector, bringing the weary messenger a bowl of food. I too was young and hot-blooded once, eager to show the world my worthiness of knighthood. But the sword-pulling contest, do you really wish to be king as well? he asked Kay with a smile. I make no pretense about that, sir. To prove myself on the field of battle is my only dream. Please remember that, my son, said Sir Ector. Pursuing one's goals with integrity is all that matters. Now go and find Arthur so that we may prepare to leave. London is a long way off. Arthur had wandered off alone, as he often did after finishing his chores. He was as devoted as ever to being a good squire for his brother. But, after all, Kay was Sir Kay now, and he rarely had anything to say to his younger brother except to bark orders at him. Arthur didn't mind, though. He was happy just to watch Kay practice his jousting and to dream of some day riding beside him in battle. In the meantime, he had to content himself with his other companions, Lionel and Jasper, his dogs. Cosmo, his falcon, 
the orphan fox cub he kept hidden in the hollow log, and the deer that came to the edge of the woods when he whistled. He was in the woods now, patiently holding out a handful of oats for the deer, when Kay came bounding through the meadows to find him. Arthur, he shouted, we're leaving for London at once. There's a big tournament. Here's your chance to show me what a good squire you can be. Hurry. Arthur stood silently for a moment. He had never been more than a few miles from his home. Was he daydreaming? Or was he really going to London to help Sir Kay bring honour and glory to their family as the whole world looked on? He ran back home, doubting his own ears, until at last he reached the courtyard and saw Sir Ector preparing their horses for the journey. All of Britain seemed to be making its way to London town that Christmas. Kings and dukes, earls and barons, counts and countesses funneled into the city gates for the great contest. Sir Ector was pleased to see old friends and fellow knights. Sir Kay was eager to register for the jousting, and Arthur was simply dazzled by it all. As Sir Ector and his sons made their way through the streets of the city, a glimmer of sunlight on steel caught Arthur's eye. How odd, he thought, a sword thrust point first into an anvil on top of a block of marble and sitting in a churchyard surrounded by guards. London is so full of wonders. Dawn arrived with a blare of trumpets, calling all contestants to the tournament. In Sir Ector's tent, Arthur buckled the chainmail onto Sir Kay and slipped the tunic of the Bon Maison colours over his brother's head. Sir Ector stood and watched until the preparation was complete, and his son stood before him in all his knightly glory. Silently they embraced, mounted their horses, and headed for the tournament grounds. The stadium for the event was the grandest ever built. Never had there been such a huge congregation of lords and ladies in England's history. The stand surrounded a great meadow, swept clean of all snow, with the combatants' tents at either end. In the central place of honour sat the Archbishop. Patiently he greeted each and every king and noble as they came forth to kiss his hand. The first event was a mock battle, otherwise known as a melee. The contestants were divided into two teams, the Reds and the Greens. Sir Kay was with the Reds who gathered at the southern end of the field while their opponents took the north. They all readied their lances and brought down their helmet visors in anticipation of combat. Then they looked to the Archbishop for a signal. Slowly he raised his handkerchief, paused and let it flutter to the ground. From both ends of the field, the thunder of thousands of horses' hooves rolled forward, shaking the earth, rattling the stands, louder and louder until a terrifying clash of metal split the air. A shower of splintered lances rained down in all directions. The audience gasped and a few ladies fainted. Nothing had prepared them for this scale of violence. Sir Kay performed admirably for he charged ahead of his teammates and unseated two of the Greens. He was already winning accolades as he wheeled his charger around to aid a fellow Red. As the teams withdrew, they revealed a battleground strewn with fallen warriors, some struggling to rise under the weight of their armour, others lying ominously still. Bits and pieces of armour and broken lances littered the field. The next charge was to be undertaken with swords. Sir Kay was appointed captain of his team for having done so well in the first round. He trotted over to Arthur and handed down his lance. Kay, you were magnificent, gushed Arthur, wiping down the steaming war horse. I need my sword, Arthur, said Sir Kay, struggling to take his helmet off. Your sword, of course, said Arthur brightly. He turned to get it but then stopped suddenly. Where was his sword? Spear? Mace? Bludgeon? But no sword? Kay, said Arthur. Could you perhaps use a battle axe? Arthur, please. My sword, said Sir Kay. We haven't much time. Of course, Kay, but just a moment. I'll, 
I'll just finish polishing it," said Arthur, slipping out through the slit in their tent. With one great leap, he landed on his pony's back and galloped madly through the deserted streets, rushing back to their camp. Where did I put that sword? He muttered, desperately searching through the bag, but to no avail. How could this happen? He thought. Kay without a sword and the whole world watching. He paced back and forth, and then a thought struck him. Kay will not be without a sword today, and I know where I can get one. A few minutes later, he trotted into the churchyard where the sword in the anvil stood on the marble block. There wasn't a guard in sight; even they had gone to the tourney. Quietly, he brought his pony up to the stone and tugged on the reins. Okay, Blaze, let's see if the sword can be unstuck. He stretched out his arms until his fingers touched the hilt. Hey. It's looser than I thought. Steady, Blaze. Steady, boy. As the pony stepped back a few paces, the sword glided out of the anvil's grip, unbalancing Arthur. He regained his seat and looked down in wonder at the mighty blade in his hand. This does not seem like an ordinary sword. Perhaps it's something the church provides for needy strangers. Hmm, that must be it. Well, I'll return it after the tournament. Someone else might need it. Thank you, sword, for saving me," he said, pressing it to his lips. Wait until Kay sees this. He flung his cloak around the great sword and rode his little horse back to the tournament with lightning speed. By now, Sir Kay had dismounted and was rather chafed. Arthur, where have you been? He shouted. You. He caught himself as Arthur dropped to one knee and opened the cloak. Your sword, my lord," Arthur said confidently. But his smile quickly disappeared when he saw Sir Kay's reaction, frozen in place, his face white as milk. Sir Kay stared at the sword. Finally, he spoke. "Where did you get this?" he asked Arthur, although he knew the answer. Arthur confessed that he had searched in vain for Sir Kay's sword and had borrowed this one instead. Get father at once and tell no one of this," said Sir Kay sternly. Arthur thought he must be in terrible trouble. Surely he could return the sword without his father knowing. Why did father have to be told? Nevertheless, he obeyed his brother and quickly returned with Sir Ector. Sir Kay closed the curtains of the tent and opened the cloak, revealing the sword to his father. Sir Ector gasped when he saw it. "Father, I am in possession of this sword," said Sir Kay nervously. "That is what matters. Therefore, I must be king of all Britain." "But how came you by it, my son?" asked Sir Ector. "Well, sire, I needed a sword." And we couldn't find mine, so I decided to use this one," said Sir Kay. Beads of sweat formed on his brow. Very well, Kay. If you drew it out of the stone, I want to see you put it back," said Sir Ector. But I have the sword," said Sir Kay. "Isn't that enough?" No," replied Sir Ector as he mounted his horse and headed toward the cathedral. Arthur rode close behind, and ever so slowly. Sir Kay mounted and followed. The churchyard was still deserted when the three arrived. Now put the sword back in the anvil," said Sir Ector bluntly. "I must see it, Father. I just do it, Kay, and you shall be king, if that's what you want." Sir Kay climbed onto the block. Sweat was now pouring off him. He raised the mighty sword over his head and plunged it downward. But the sharp point slipped off the surface of the anvil, causing Sir Kay to fall headfirst off the block. Now, son, tell me, how came you by this sword? Asked Sir Ector again. Arthur brought it to me," said Sir Kay, dusting himself off. He lost my other one. Suddenly, a fear gripped Sir Ector's heart. Arthur, my boy," he said quietly. Will you try it for us? Certainly, Father," said Arthur. "But do we have to tell anyone about this? 
can't we just... Son, please, said Sir Ector solemnly. If you can put the sword in that anvil, then please do so now. With a pounding heart, the lad took the sword from Sir Kay's hand and climbed slowly onto the block of marble. Raising it with both hands above his head, he thrust it downward through the anvil, burying the point deep within the stone. Effortlessly, he pulled it out again, glanced at his stunned father, and shoved the sword into the stone even deeper this time. Sir Ector shrieked and sank to his knees. His mouth moved, but no words came out. He put his hands together as in prayer. Silently, Sir Kay knelt and did the same. Father, what are you doing? cried Arthur, leaping down from the stone. Please, get up! I don't understand! Now I know, sputtered Sir Ector, choking back tears. Now I know who you are. I'm your son, father, said the bewildered lad, crouching down by his father, putting his head to Sir Ector's chest. After a few deep breaths, Sir Ector regained his composure. He smiled sadly down at Arthur and stroked his head. Ah, fate would have it otherwise, my boy. Look there behind you. He pointed to the gold lettering on the marble block, which stated the purpose of the sword in the anvil. Arthur sat in silence and stared at the words in the marble. Although you were adopted, I've loved you like my own child, Arthur, said Sir Ector softly. But now I realize that you have the blood of kings in you. To discover your birthright is the true reason we came to London. You are now our king, and we your faithful servants. At this, Arthur broke into tears. I don't want to be king, not if that means losing my father, he sobbed. You have a great destiny before you, Arthur. There's no use avoiding it, said Sir Ector. Arthur wiped his eyes with his sleeve. He straightened up so he could look Sir Ector in the eyes. A few minutes passed. Very well, Arthur finally said slowly. Whatever my destiny may be, I am willing to accept it. But I still need you with me. Then so it shall be, lad, so it shall be said Sir Ector. They sat quietly for a time, comforting each other, until they felt another presence. From across the yard, a hooded figure quietly floated into the fading light of the winter afternoon and knelt down beside them. Merlin, said Sir Ector, bowing his head to the famous enchanter. I've been waiting for you, Arthur, said the wizard. You know me, my lord, asked Arthur. I put you in this good man's care many years ago and have kept an eye on you ever since. How did you do that, sire? We live far from here. Oh, I have my ways, replied Merlin, but you still manage to surprise me. The sword pulling contest isn't until tomorrow and you pulled it out a day early, he said with a chuckle. But what is to become of me now? asked Arthur. Let us begin with tomorrow, replied the old sorcerer. We must still hold the contest in order to prove to the world that you are indeed the rightful heir. I shall come for you when the time is right. But after that, sire, what is my future? asked the boy. Merlin weighed this question carefully. He wasn't at all sure whether the boy was prepared for his answer. Finally, he spoke. Although I can tell you only what my powers suggest, I know for certain that they point to greatness. Greatness surrounds you like a golden cloak, and your achievements could inspire humankind for centuries to come. You alone can fulfill this destiny only should you wish it. You alone can decide, Arthur. Arthur breathed deeply and cast his eyes downward. He thought of all the goodbyes he would have to say. He thought of his fishing hole and the birds that ate seeds from his hand. He thought of the deer that came when he called them. What time tomorrow, sire? he asked. Your time will come after all have tried and failed to pull the sword, replied Merlin. I will be ready, sire, said Arthur. 
Then he rose, bade Merlin farewell, and silently returned to his tent. On Christmas morning, the Archbishop said Mass for the largest gathering he had seen in years. The ground surrounding the cathedral was so filled with those seeking to make history or watch it being made. As soon as the service ended, those who wished to try for the throne formed a line next to the marble block. Leading the line was King Urien of Gore, husband to Margaes, Uther Pendragon's adopted daughter. Ever since the High King's death, Urien had claimed loudly that he was the rightful heir. Indeed, he took his position on the marble block with a great sense of authority and gave the sword a confident tug. Then another, and another. Urien was sweating and yanking furiously when finally was asked to step down. Next came King Lot of Orkney, husband to Morgan le Fay. King Lot felt certain that his wife's magical powers would assure his victory, but pull and tug as he might, he could not move the sword. After that, King Mark of Cornwall, King Leo de Grants of Camelard, and King Ryans of North Wales all took their place on the stone and failed. The Dukes of Buckingham, Winchester, and Colchester did not fare any better. Some thought the longer they waited, the looser the sword would become, thereby improving their chances. But this was not the case, for the sword never budged, not even slightly. Kings, dukes, earls, counts, and knights all left that marble block empty-handed. Finally, as the day waned and the line neared its end, the crowd soon grew impatient for a winner. This is when Merlin went for Arthur. Sir Ector and Sir Kay opened the curtains of their tent when they saw Merlin approaching. Your hour has come, my lord, said the old wizard to Arthur, who was standing alone in the centre of the tent. Silently, the boy walked forth as one in a dream. The crowd made way for them as they entered, for Merlin was still revered by all. But who could these others be? The crowd thought to themselves. And what were they doing here with Merlin? Merlin brought Arthur before the archbishop and bowed deeply. Arthur dropped to one knee. My lord, said Merlin, I present to you a most worthy candidate for this contest. Has he your permission to attempt to pull yonder sword from the stone? The archbishop gazed down at the handsome lad. Merlin, we are not familiar with this youth, nor with his credentials. By what right does he come to this place? By the greatest right, my lord, said Merlin, for this is the true-born son of King Uther Pendragon and Queen Igraine. The crowd broke into a loud clamour at hearing this. The startled archbishop raised his hands, but order was not easily restored. Can you prove this, Merlin? asked the archbishop. With your permission, sire, blurted Arthur suddenly. Perhaps I can prove it myself. Very well then, lad said the Archbishop, admiring Arthur's youthful boldness. You have my permission. If what Merlin says is true, may God be with you. Arthur rose and stepped onto the marble block. He grabbed hold of the mighty golden hilt with both hands. A surge of sparkling warmth travelled up his arms, across his shoulders and throughout his body. With one mighty tug, he freed the sword from the anvil and lifted it heavenward. The blade flashed like lightning as he swung it around his head for all to see. Then turning the point downward again, he drove the sword back into the anvil with equal ease. The entire gathering stood dumbstruck for a long moment, trying to comprehend what they had just seen. Arthur looked about for reassurance. He looked to Sir Ector, then to Merlin, then to the Archbishop. 
They all simply stared at him with eyes wide in amazement. A child then began to giggle and clapped his hands in glee. Then, so did another. Then, cheers began to ring out as people found their voices again. Suddenly, a thunder of shouting and clapping rose up around Arthur. Amidst the tumult, he closed his eyes and whispered, "Thank you, Father." Then he grabbed the sword's hilt for a second time and withdrew it. As he lifted it above his head, a thousand swords throughout the crowd were raised in solidarity. Arthur drove the sword back into the anvil and pulled it out once again. This time, as he lifted the great blade to the sky, more swords were raised, along with brooms, rakes, and walking sticks, as counts and common folk alike saluted their newfound king. Not everyone was overjoyed at this turn of events, however. Although all had seen the miracles performed, several kings and dukes were unwilling to recognize Arthur's right to the throne. Loudest among the grumblers were King Lot and King Urien. Arthur's brothers-in-law. How dare this beardless, unknown country boy think he can be made high king to rule over us? They said. It's obvious that Merlin has just been using the boy to promote himself. But these malcontents gained no support from those around them and were quickly shouted down. So they gathered themselves together and stormed away in a huff of indignation. To everyone else, the day belonged to Arthur. All the other kings and nobles rushed forth to show their acceptance, for they trusted Merlin and were grateful to have a leader at last. They hoisted the young king to be above their heads to parade him through the streets of London. As the noisy procession flowed out of the churchyard, the archbishop hobbled over to Merlin to offer congratulations for a very successful plan. Thank you, my lord, but I think we are not yet finished," said the wizard. The archbishop looked puzzled. I fear that King Lot and King Urien and those other discontented souls will leave us no peace until they have another chance at the sword. We must offer them a new trial on New Year's Day. And so they did, but again, no one could budge the sword but Arthur. However, these same troublesome kings and dukes still refused to acknowledge his victory. So another trial took place on Candlemas, and yet another on Easter. By now, the people had grown impatient, for they had believed in Arthur all along and had grown to love him. The idea of having a fresh young king inspired hope and optimism. The world suddenly felt young again. Finally, after the trial held on Pentecost, they cried out, "Enough! Arthur has proven himself five times now. We will have him for our king and no other." The archbishop and Merlin agreed. There was proof beyond dispute at this point, so the coronation was set for May Day in the great cathedral of London. Upon arriving that morning, Arthur stepped up on the block and pulled the sword from the anvil. For the last time, with a blade pointing heavenward, he entered the church, walked solemnly down the central aisle, and laid the sword upon the altar. The archbishop administered the holy sacraments, and finally placed the crown upon Arthur's head. Ten thousand cheers burst forth as the young king emerged from the cathedral. At Merlin's suggestion. Arthur stepped up on the marble block to speak to the people. A hush fell over the masses as he raised his hands to address them. People of Britain, we are now one, and so shall we remain as long as there is breath in me. My faith in your courage and wisdom is boundless. I ask now for your faith in me. In your trust, I shall find my strength. For your good, I shall dedicate my life. May this sword lead us together to our destiny. The end.